I'm going to hit the record button. Okay, I'll stop swearing. Damn it. (laughs) (laughs) All right, everybody. Welcome back to another special Corona Geek. We're here today to talk all about plugins. Today, I think this is the era of plugins for Corona, isn't it? I mean, we've had the the marketplace for a while. It's been um, free plugins for a while. Uh, People have been, you know, developers have been creating great plugins and putting them up on the store. But now we're to that point where we're doing paid plugins now and we're really excited by that uh the first of course the first corona paid plugin was uh the splash screen plugin which went up here recently and that was really the beginning the the uh the test you know it's like almost a canary in the coal mine i guess you would say that, that if this works then we can move forward for the uh, community to submit their own plugins so uh we're, we've got a beta program which we'll talk about here in a little bit uh, today, we're going to look at paid plugins. We're going to look at some developer plugins. Uh, we've got Scott joining us. He's going to talk about what he's working on. We've got Sergey, who will be here. Oh, there he is right there. Uh, he'll be talking about his vibration plugin. Uh, Ed will be talking about his Math2D plugin and possibly a Sudoku generator. Sudoku, Sudoku, Sudoku. Oh, Doku generator. I never can say that correctly. For you Americans, it's this. Never mind. Right. And uh, and hopefully Danny Glover, uh, not the actor, but the developer, will join us today and talk about his PayPal plugin, which is exciting as well. So, uh, I'll slap him. You know, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and ping him and say, uh, come on come on over and join us. Also, if we have time, we're going to talk about the project that Pony Wolf, uh, Michael Wilson over at Pony Wolf, is working on to create a new game demo complete with source code, uh, graphic assets, custom sounds, and everything else that will be provided to the community uh, for free. So we're looking forward to that, and uh, hopefully we'll actually be able to get that into the asset store at some point and uh, you know, into the marketplace as an asset um, so that people can eventually be able to provide uh, you know, art and sounds and everything else besides plugins. So with that in mind, uh, Scott, what exactly are you working on? I know I had it in my notes, but I've 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 slept. <laughs> um, it's a Pebble plugin for the Pebble Watch. Um, it allows you to send data from the phone to the watch and vice versa. So you can like uh, it'll allow you to send strings like from the phone. Like if you, I'll show you a demo here in a second. But um, hold on, let me see if I can pull up a uh, screen share here. Okay. Does so anybody on the panel have a Pebble Watch? Pebble Watch, yeah. It's, I think it has like 4 million users now, and I think it's, uh, it's like probably, it's pretty popular. Let me see. Well, that's great. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, yeah, it looks good. Let me see. As you can see, we're connected. I'll show you. Oh, see, as you can see, it just launched. Okay. I'm going to like, uh, hold on. This is kind of complicated. I'm going to like push the middle button here, and it should say, hold on. As you can see, the message says like up. It's, it's kind of hard to do both here. Oh yeah, so when you push it, when you push it on the, the watch, then it's showing up here on the screen. I was I was actually focusing through through the watch, but you have to look uh, at the messages on the screen. Yeah, look at message select. I, I'm going to push the down button. As you can see, it changes to down, up, and select. So it's sending there. And as you can see right now, it says blank right now. I'm going to try to uh, send a message to the watch here. We're in uh, prompt. We'll say. Hello, send, see it says hello on the watch, we'll send uh, Corona, send, see it says Corona on the watch. Nice. So yeah, you can send uh, it's, uh, any string data you want uh, right to the watch. Um, and I don't know, and let me see if, can you guys see the code or no? I think you guys are just showing this screen right now. Yeah, we're just seeing the simulator at the moment or the, the reflector. Which is funny, right? Because you, you're you're communicating. I'm assuming from the watch to the to the computer via Bluetooth, and then you're using reflector. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> using my phone. It should be more. I don't know how laggy it is. It's probably going to be lots of lag. Is I don't know. I know it looks looks pretty pretty real time on this end. I don't know. I mean, it's hard. You know, it's hard to know for sure. But it, it, everything seems to match up. Yeah. And I don't, uh, did you guys see, like, if you, like, launch the app, it will, like, launch the Pebble app. Like, I already have, I've already built, um, oh, hold on, Danny just texted me. <laughs> I mean, not that. <laughs> says either. 
He's not on Hangouts anymore. No. Hold on. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Here, uh, I'll, I'll send him the link to the... Yeah, I, I sent him the link. Oh, did you get... Okay, and what was it? Oh, I forgot. What was I saying? Uh, yeah, it allows you, you like, to build... Um, you were talking about when you launched the app. Yeah, hold on. Let me see if I can show you. As you can see, uh, the app will automatically launch here in a second. Should Let's see. There, yeah, it's getting ready to launch here. Should any second. Well, on the reflector, I don't know. Uh, now we may, may have a lag because. Of, uh, oh, there you go. He restarted it. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Should launch here in a second. There it is. You see the app launches right up, and it will. Um, this is an app I wrote in Pebble Cloud. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you just write your own Pebble app, and you can like send data back and forth to Corona via Bluetooth. So yeah. this is all. This is all just sending strings back and forth. So I mean, what else? What else is there? Like, uh, you, there's like if you want like numbers and like booleans, you obviously can convert it to a string and like you know send yeah. it there. So in it, like if you're thinking about what possibilities. Um, yeah. like, the, like the pebble has an accelerometer. So I was thinking like, you know, you could like move your hand around and like, you know, control the Pe uh, Corona app. And like, uh, I don't know, there's all kinds of things. There's this like kind of limitless, like whatever you can do with pebble, you can like send back and forth. Nice. I see. I don't have a pebble watch. So it's a, it's a little hard for me to imagine the possibilities, like, but like it has a, a screen, it has a microphone, it has three buttons and an accelerometer. So you can probably take advantage of all that. Also it has, the newer ones have like heart rate monitoring, um, it has like Pebble Health, you can like send your steps back and forth. And of course it has an e-paper display. So and Scott, did you say that you have to build the app uh, for the watch separately in a different program? How did yeah. you Hold on, let me see if I can pull it up. It's in Pebble Cloud. Hold on, let me pull up Pebble Cloud. Here, hold on. Ah, shoot. Pebble. Uh, yeah, it's all written in uh, C. And um, I think you might be able to write in JavaScript, but I think that's kind of in beta right now. So is Pebble, I'm not familiar with that. So is Pebble Cloud the only... Uh, no, uh, Wait, you're right, or can you go through their IDEs or anything? Uh, hold on. Yeah, yeah, I'll show you their IDE. Hold on. Yeah, well, Pebble Cloud is probably the way I would do it, but you you can, like, there's some other ways to write. I think there's, like, a, uh, like it. you're not really a wire to the watch. It's all done through Bluetooth. Let me see if I can share this part. Hold on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll, yeah, you'll probably have to turn the screen share off, and then there you go. Uh, can you see this? Let's see. Yeah, we'll pull up some C code here. See if we can. I, I kind of just used their template. I was kind of lazy, so I just no, I was mainly focused on the plugins. Let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, and you, yeah, this is all the code right here. A couple lines. And um, let me see. Like, if you push, where is it? Like if you push uh, down, it will uh, send. It will send the uh, down text um, uh, to the phone. This is all done through Bluetooth. I'll probably make this a uh, template available, like you know, with a plugin, obviously, so you can just uh, have it, have a launch point. Yeah, I'm sure if you're uh, if you're dipping your toe into Pebble programming, you, yeah. you you're gonna have to you're gonna have to uh, you're gonna have to educate yourself on its environment and then the programming, you know, C programming language and all that kind of stuff as well. So, but it'd be yeah. nice. Yeah. It would be nice to have a nice little, you know, sort of a starter template just so you could prove to yourself that you could do it. Uh, they have like a really good guide. Hold on, let me see. I'm kind of Googling it here. It's um, like, um, they have a really good start guide. Let me see. If can, well, they have, let's see. they have like a, like uh, if you go to their website, you can like see a bunch of templates and like they have a bunch of stuff. They have like so much, they have lots of documentation. Oh, great. Yeah, so, yeah. so this is very cool. I think it's, I think it's going to be, well, obviously you have a Pebble watch, which makes it super relevant for you, right? Cause you're like, yeah. Hey, I want, I want to do stuff with it. And then, as you said, there's a big community of, of, of um, people who own Pebble watches. So that means there's developers who are looking to tie into it. So, um, 
being able to create a game or doing doing something like that with Corona and then and then tying those two things together would make a nice combo of watch and app. Do they do you know if does Pebble does ha, Pebble have its own sort of like um, way of creating apps for the phones or is that something that's just sort of left out? Uh, like uh, hold on, let me switch back. I kind of switched here. Hold on. Yeah, I was going to ask. Do they have a store where people yes. who have the watch can purchase apps and so forth? Yeah, th yeah, yes, they do. You can see it right here. I'll probably show you in the phone here. They have their own little app store. Hold on, let me switch. I'm switching screens. I probably should just do this. It's probably better. So yeah, they have their own little app store right here. Oh, can you guys see it? Yep. Oh, yeah, they have their own apps and such. And yeah, I don't know. You probably check it out later, but hold on, let me see. I was trying to share. As you can see, I actually made this one. They featured the quick if. Nice. Oh. So, so that but that's that, those are uh, obviously those are. Yeah, those are all apps. written. But those are apps for the watch, not apps for the phone. Uh, yes, you you probably have to write. You have to write uh, both a Pebble app and a iOS app. And uh, I think this is also really good for Pebble, like Pebble developers. Like they have to, like you know, they have to use uh, Xcode and. Uh, what is it? Android Studios to write their own apps. There's not really too many ways to write write it without getting into Objective C and Java. Nice. No, I love it. I love it. I love it. This is very cool. Now makes me, uh, you know, makes me curious about Pebble. You know, what the, what the possibilities are there. Yeah, there's lots of possibilities. They now have like smart straps, and I could like go on forever, but I'd rather like they, there's lots of things. So, what, when what do you well one what what features do you think you'll be adding on to that next, or do you think it's feature complete already? And then when when will the plugin be available? Okay, so let me answer the first question first. The features there's not really like hold on, let me pull up. I'm gonna, let me share my screen again. Hold on, um, there's not really like that many features. Um, hold on, let me pull up their guide. Um, there's not really like that many things you can do with their. Um, like with their SDK, there's really only like sending back and forth um, messages. There's not really like too many complicated things to it. Anything else you probably have to do in like C. Um, so yeah, it's basically kind of feature complete already. There's not really that many APIs. Gotcha. Well, that's, well, that's good. Yeah, just I'm always curious as to, you know, there seems like there's always the, the base implementation of something and then other yeah. things coming. Yeah. So yeah, this is um, the SD, like I use their official one um, and the app can be found here. They've kind of, uh, uh, well, they haven't really updated in a while, but which makes me kind of curious. But I think, um, I think it's mainly because they want developers. They've kind of leaned away from community. I mean, uh, companion apps, but I was like thinking this is probably a good opportunity to get more com uh, community apps just like, you know, with uh, Corona. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay, cool. Well, awesome, and and so you, I'm sure that's already been submitted as a plugin. What? Oh, this? Yeah, the Pebble. Oh, oh Pebble plugin. No, it's actually I'm still gonna finish up Android, and I'm almost done with it. And then I gotta write some docs, and I should be. I'm hoping by the end of the week it'll be up on the store. And it will be available for for uh, it'll be cross platform iOS and Android. Uh, yeah, it's not really available for. They don't really have a legit platform for like you know Mac and Windows and stuff. Right. It doesn't make much sense. Or or Windows. I mean you said you said in the past year you're not really a Windows guy, right? I'm not really a Windows guy. And for Windows phone, uh Pebble doesn't like, you know, they don't really actually officially support it. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Very cool. Any questions? Anybody have any questions on the panel? Uh my question would be, do we do you think that Apple will have a problem since it's a competitor watch to to <laughs> you know create an app that is targeting a competitor watch now that Apple uh, has a watch? Uh, there's actually been like many companion apps um, already like made for Pebble. Um, like I, I could name, I think it was like Smartwatch Pro. It's another app on the App Store. I've I've seen a couple like recent ones. I, I think that there haven't there hasn't really been any problems. One thing to note though is before you publish, they have like a little guide. I think you have to like whitelist your app or something like that to take advantage of Bluetooth communication with the watch. So you probably, I think you have to like email them or something. I'm, I'm sure they're pretty fast. I haven't tried submitting an app yet. So yeah. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah. I, so it sounds like so far they're accepting some, as far as we know, because there's some in the store, but that could change. Hopefully. Hopefully not. Hopefully they don't play uh, Monopoly. Yeah. Yeah, that's not like them. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there's other things, right? There's, others, there's, there's other stuff like uh, competing services or whatnot that are there. I think they, they just really get upset when they get cut out of the loop, right? When like Spotify. Well, well, I think they, they, I think they get really, Apple seems to get really upset when they get cut out of the monetization piece. The money loop. The money loop. Yeah. When, when, when you can use their platform, but then don't, they don't make any revenue out of it, which is, you know, I mean, fair where they're, they're hosting the, the stuff, delivering it, doing all the, the back end heavy lifting. So they just want, what's, uh, what's, 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 uh, Charlie Brown's sister say in, uh, you know, the Charlie Brown show. And she's like, I just want my fair share. I just want what's coming to me. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Awesome. We'll look forward to that coming out. And uh, thanks for sharing it with us. Cool. So, um, Sergey, vibrations. Good vibrations. What, what, what are going on there, man? Right. So, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Awesome. So I've been working recently on the vibration plugin for iOS, and now it's done. Uh, it uses the Taptic engine in iPhone 7 and 7 Plus. Huge thanks to Scott for making it possible because I didn't have, I didn't have uh, iPhone 7, and he has, and he helped me a lot in the, in the development of this plugin. So yeah, uh, obviously I don't have anything to show you, but uh, you can believe me that it works pretty nicely. I can. Uh, I can screen share the documentation and show you. So my first question is, I mean, you mentioned Scott's, uh, I know Scott has like a Taptic Engine plugin. Um, so how is the vibration plugin different than the Taptic Engine plugin? I mean, I mean they, they sound different, but. His is better. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh... Is, it, is the vibration one cross-platform? Oh, well, I guess it, well, it, I guess it would it be. Right? cross-platform. Is it? Right. Oh, okay. So the Taptic one would be specific to iOS and then the vibration one would be cross-platform. So can you see the browser? Yes. So yeah, currently um, iOS 10, of course. And uh, it turns out uh, if you look at the uh, official, official documentation uh, for the Apple, uh, is it displayed? Yeah. you. Uh, you can't have anything that is continuous. You only have those like this, uh, events, for example, impact feedback, which is very simple, very basic one. And you can have uh, only uh, uh, the style of the feedback, which is uh, light, heavy, or medium. And you can only tell it that it just occurred, nothing else. So very limited. So what I've been working on is to mimic the Android behavior of the plugin of the Taptic Engine. On Android, uh, uh, the only thing you can do is to set a uh, time in, for which the vibration motor vibrates. And you can set up some patterns, for example, SOS pattern or some other patterns that you want to vibrate. And uh, it turns out you can call uh, Taptic Engine uh, and invoke it in each frame in Corona and it will produce continuous vibration. So this way I, could, I was able to make it vibrate for a long time. Uh, so you can have uh, patterns. So, uh, so you could do something, I'm sorry. So you could do something like when, uh, like when you're playing a console game and you get, you get hit, the controller vibrates, um, but when you you die or something like that, then it like really goes to town and vibrates for a very very long time. I mean, you could do that on on the phone with like multiple explosions or some sort of dis destructive scene. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Android version of vibration is kind is very limited uh, to the way it only produces you time and doesn't uh, give you any uh, control over. Uh, the, f the power of vibration, but on Apple, you have much more control. So uh, I've made a new interface, which a new function in the plugin, which is new haptic, uh, that returns 
a haptic object with uh, several, with a couple functions, which is prepare and invoke. Invoke actually makes uh, the vibration, and you can set up different parameters like uh, the style of the uh, feedback that is uh, that is available in iOS, which is impact, which is like a single uh, vibration selection. It is very light, and um, yeah, it's very peculiar. Uh, what what Apple wants you to do is to call impact when something on the screen touches something else. Selection is when you select something on the screen, and notification is just notification which can be uh, here, success, warning, or error. All these uh, notifications, they differ in the pattern. So success pattern has some vibration, warning another, and error another one. So you can feel uh, what your phone tells you, if it's a uh, was success, if it was a uh, warning or an error. So uh, this is kind of cool. And you can totally use these methods to fine tune the vibration patterns that you really want uh, for, the, for the user to feel. The prepare a method, you can call it uh, right after uh, the invoke a method to keep uh, the Taptic engine running. Uh, and to prepare it to receive another invoke actions. If you don't call prepare, Taptic Engine will shut down to save power, obviously. And uh, so, yeah, prepare improves latency. So when something happens on the screen, uh, if the Taptic Engine was prepared, you call invoke, it happens instantly. Nice, nice. So let me ask you this. Yeah. How, how, how did you... Uh, how did you test this? I mean, I don't. Do you have a a new iPhone? I told you, uh, Scott told me, uh, helped me. Okay, because I know he has a new iPhone, so that's yeah. that's what it is. Okay. Yes, I was I was working with him, and okay. um, I thought the Taptic Engine was available on the iPhone six S as well. It doesn't work. Yeah, for some ridiculous reason, Apple <laughs> does not let you. Uh, invoke the Taptic Engine uh, in anything but iPhone 7 and 7 Plus. So you, even if you have iPhone 6S, uh, you can't use this API. I hope they will change it in the future somehow because it's kind of ridiculous. Easy solution to get a new phone. Right, right. Maybe it will uh, be uh, an exclusive feature for maybe a year and then they re release with another iOS version. Hey, now it's available in everything, even in the iPod 3GS. Yeah, that, that does make sense though. I mean, you know, keep, the, keep, the, uh, keep the benefit of the new hardware, right? And say, hey, you know, go out and get the new hardware. And then once everybody kind of, once that kind of dies down, you're like, well, okay, everybody who bought something's gonna, you know, already has, then you can say, oh, well, release it to everybody that's cool now. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. What was so that? This, this Scott showed a uh, test uh, application, which we used to, uh, to figure out how the Taptic Engine actually works here. Also, I uh, got a great idea to record audio of uh, vibration. And I, when I, uh, actually I can show you, it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, so you were, you're gonna show us the waveforms? Yeah. Okay. I can show you the waveforms. Because <laughs> yeah, because Zoom doesn't do the whole audio playback thing very well. Yeah, Taptic Engine is pretty cool though. Yeah. So. We this is uh, the waveform of the Taptic Engine in walking several times, like one, two, three, four, five, six. It's very close, but it produces a, a somewhat continuous waveform. If we open up a different one, like this, probably you don't see it. I need to switch the window. This one. Yeah. 
yeah, this is the waveform of, uh, you can see uh, uh, the individual bits. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it gets, uh, gets uh, spread out there in the middle and then gets close, to, close together in the end. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is in the code. It calls uh, haptic, haptic engine to call several times, but with a delay of uh, 100 milliseconds or so. Yeah, 100. Which means it has a sort of a, a gradual increase in an... Uh... Yeah, if you can see that it has a pretty quick uh, increase and then a steady decrease. But uh, all in all, it's pretty short, like mm. uh, 20, 30 milliseconds. So it's very short. And uh, because it's very short, I was able to actually get a nice result of uh, patterns. They don't clink up together. Yeah, lots, um, of, lots of precision. That's interesting. Definitely opens up some opportunities. What would you, I'm just, this is addressing to the panel. What do you guys, first thing that comes to your mind, what would you use it for? Well, one pass, I use it as a little, like, you know, have you ever used, uh, what is it, um, iTunes? Like, have you ever used like, uh, the iTunes app, like with the little scroller thing on the side? Like, it like, like it vibrates when you like uh, go to each letter on one pass, which I think was pretty cool. Just like a tiny little example. Okay, okay. So rather than, okay, so again, rather than audible sound, you're really, you're getting, you're getting a, a physical feedback from the device. Another, another way form that uh, Scott recorded was uh, SOS pattern. So you can see uh, three dots uh, that come before, then uh, three dashes here, and again, three dots. Works pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. That is cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd have to sit and stare off into space a little bit on that, kind of figure out like all the different things you could do with it. It's, 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 it's not something that, I mean, I, when I long press on something or, or, or you know, whatever on my, my iPhone 6 Plus S, I mean, I get, a, I get feedback and stuff, but I, don't, I just haven't become accustomed to it yet. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, of haptic feedback. You also could probably make your own uh, peak and pop and Corona now that like, you know, they have like a light and a hard one. If you like go all the way in like a hard vibration, mm -hmm. which I think is a good uh, use case. If you ever have like a non game type app. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's right. right. You can do that in a game though. Can you too? You can have a I peak guess. and a pop. Yes. For example, when you get heat, you can totally vibrate. That's for sure. Yeah, dude. Rather than the, the rather than just a normal, um, yeah, in, interesting. Well, very cool. When is that going to be available? It is. Right it's now. already available, right? Yeah. With all with 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 all the updates, with all that. Wait. Yeah, with all that, it's available now. And right now, I'm working on documentation for the uh, Bluetooth plugin, and I want it to be uh, so. The binary is in the store. You can't get it uh, at the moment yet, so it, it has to become visible, but you can download it as a jar if you use an enterprise, for, for instance. Is it going to be paid plugin or? Uh, Bluetooth for now is going to be uh, free for the time that is uh, in the beta version. So I finish, uh, I'm finishing up the documentation for Android. I'm implementing iOS version. We testing it on the real devices with the real users and after that sometime like, it will become paid and that and that's worth backing up for just a second to kind of state those those um housekeeping pieces that somebody might uh, might have missed we, we kind of jumped into the, the show here in order to give scott the, the time that he would need to present his plugin but for everybody who's listening and doesn't who hasn't followed the blog who doesn't know, isn't aware uh right now in the market corona marketplace we're doing a closed beta and Sergey and Scott and uh, Danny and, and Ed and uh, Stephen, I think you may even be in there, right? Uh, have contributed plugins, and those plugins are, are you guys are stepping through the uh, back end administrative pieces to make sure that the controls work that the way that you want, and kind of giving feedback to the Corona team so that we can refine things and stuff. But these, but initially, 
their their plugins, which some of them have been free and some of them are just brand new plugins, are becoming paid plugins and they're all part, part of a beta program. So uh, they're sort of they're sort of quietly being rolled out now. Like the the PayPal plugin is up there. Uh, I think the replay kit, yeah, is is there. And these things are being quietly rolled out, and it's because we're doing the closed beta and trying to make sure that we get all the kinks worked out. But eventually, you know, we're going to make a big um, uh, a big broadcast about it, and that's that's the beginning of getting paid plugins, community su- submitted paid plugins, out into the marketplace. So it's it's I mean it's it's almost like you know, we've been waiting for this for so long and then now it's here and, and, and it's sort of quietly being rolled out. And, and then, you know, once we kind of flip the switch, it'll be like, oh, you know, they're all, they'll almost be anticlimactic. But what is really exciting stuff because these are uh, extending, these plugins are extending the power of Corona and developers are now going to have the opportunity to be able to monetize the hard work that they put into these plugins. So I'm excited about it. And the reason, the reason it's quiet is because we, want to work out the kinks yeah it's better to work out the kinks and then do the final release instead of hey here they are and oh by the way we just had a problem sorry yeah oh sorry go ahead let me ask you this um do they plan on making it so like for a paid plugin that you that me as a developer can use it test it out but it i couldn't actually do a store build with it but i could do a local build um to side load kind so of I can, try, I can try try before it. you buy yeah Balls. try before you buy kind of scenario because i think a lot of these cases i could see i know for myself unless there's really specific need or you know niche that is being filled by a plug-in somebody may want to just try it out and see well is this something that I could integrate into something more that how cool is it? You know, um, I think if you can get people's hands on it and get them playing with it, there's more of a chance. Yeah. Paul they, said, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Finish. That they'll buy it um, and create a, a use for it. So I, I don't know how difficult that is to, to differentiate between a store build and, you know, a side load build, but that would be pretty cool if that could be accomplished, I think. Um, yeah, Paul said that he's, uh, I, I brought up something similar to basically what you said, like using like Corona viewer and just being on the test and simulator. He said that's, uh, in the future, he said that's, oh, um, here it is definitely free trials for subscription type products is definitely on the roadmap, the way you described it, but it'll probably be after a few months rather than sooner. Yeah. Initially, initially we need to get pay plugins out and then right on the heels of that is our assets, right? Being able to, to do asset packs, to do audio, to be able to do all that stuff like that. And, and um, so then things like try, try before you buy those types of things become uh, nice to haves, right? We're trying to get the essentials in and then the nice to haves are definitely something that, that we would do. And I, th- I totally agree because I personally, I love a 14 day trial. I love a, you know, try it before you buy it, right? Just to prove yourself that, that it's actually going to, it does what you want it to do and that the benefits are there. Um, and especially as the, the marketplace grows, you know, there eventually there's going to be, uh, just like we were talking about before, there's the uh, the haptic engine plugin and then there's the vibration plugin and you're like, okay, well, they sound very much similar, um, but you need to be able to explore them before you kind of dig in and, and buy one or the other, right? So... One remark, though, about vibration plugin that is going to remain free. So yeah, vibration plugin, uh, toast plugin, and flashlight. They're kind of basic, so I decided to keep them free. Is that is that was that the deciding factor? Like it was, you felt like they were just basics, so you're kind of like, hey, I'll just I'll just put them out there as maybe sort of marketing or lead generation pieces or just community. Yeah, it, pay it, it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense to charge a small amount of money for them, like a dollar or two dollars. Just just pointless and uh, having them free is much better for the computing for the community yeah. and for the face of developer i wouldn't i wouldn't imagine that the flashlight plugin has a lot of maintenance involved uh yeah, flashlight actually was uh one of the uh hard things because of the update on ios and the camera permissions and other stuff so it's it, 
it, uh, they still require some maintenance, but not as much as other plugins, for example, QR or text to speech. Yeah, yeah, you're not, you're not uh, implementing uh, Google Play game services here. <laughs> Which I say that because you, you wrote that plugin, so mm -hmm. with an extensive API and backward compatibility. Bluetooth is also quite uh, wide API. Well, let's, well that's, that's fantastic. I love it. Let's move, let's move on to, um, I, got some, I got some weird audio stuff going on there. Uh, let's move on to Math2D and or uh, Sudoku. So what <laughs> I'm totally not able to say the words. Sudoku, kudoduku. <laughs> My God, I, I don't know why people have so much trouble with that word. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen because it's easier. If I can figure it out. Share screen. Here it is. Okay, so in a nutshell, I am currently working on releasing two plugins, and then I'm going to. I've got some other things in the wings. And the way I approach, uh, I am approaching plugins, is. Um, Something is suitable for a plugin in my mind if it can only be done natively. So what you guys have done in your plugins is stuff that you would absolutely need to do natively. You couldn't do that in Lua. Um, or it's something that needs a speed increase. And so for me, naturally, uh, the 2D math library, which is already out, the pure Lua version has been out for a long time as a free plugin. But it's, you know, it's speedy, but it's not as speedy as it could be. So that was a, a natural, um, how, how do I say this? A natural um, conversion to native. So uh, the first of the plugins that I'm working on, oh, and I should say that these are not going to be out quite yet. I'm doing my submission today, and then I'll probably get some feedback telling me that Edge goofed this up or whatever. I, I'm expecting that. It's a little bit new for me. Um, so the Math2D plugin has been converted to native, and I've got the local version tested. And um, what do I say about this? It's going to be everything that the previous version was, and then I've added a bunch of new features. So uh, just I'll show you the benchmarks real quick. I mean, I won't go into too much detail. But if you can see this graph here, this is a test of all the old features versus the new version of the plugin. So the new version of the plugin has many more features than are listed here, or many more operations. But in a nutshell, the, uh, the green lines are the, the run times of the plugin version, and the blue lines are the run times of the Lua-only version. And shorter is better, and is, if you look at it real quickly, you can see that all the green lines are significantly shorter, which is the plugin, of course, is going to be much faster. Now, this was run on a PC, so you're gonna see varied behavior on the different platforms, but invariably, they will be faster on than the Lua version. Um, in addition to all the standard math um, features that were supported in the pure Lua version, I've added a number of new features that are useful for game development. Stuff like um, checking to see if something is in the field of view of an object, so in other words, if your, your field of view is 90 degrees, so 45 de degrees to the left, 45 degrees to the right, and an object is facing at 135 degrees, can that object, the player, for example, see another object that is supposedly in front of it? Uh, things like, uh, is an object in front, behind, left, or right of the current object or the observer? Uh, line intersection tests. And these are, I'm using MakeDocs uh, to do my documentation, and I'm currently working on doing the deployment to GitHub because I'd like to keep all my docs up on, uh, on a Git just for easy maintenance. Uh, segment versus segment, which is similar to lines. The difference is, is if you don't know in math, is that a line is an infinite thing, whereas a segment is delineated by two points. So uh, for game developers, uh, typically segment-segment intersection is what they're looking for because they're looking for a collision or raycast type of thing. And how do I explain this? You can do ray casting in Corona already, but it's kind of an expensive operation. And so what this allows you to do is do sort of a pretest using my code. And then you could do multiples of these along a path and say, okay, now it might be worthwhile actually doing the ray cast to find out exactly where that collision occurred on the body. So 
Uh, one of the things I'm going to be doing on this after I do the deployment is creating little micro examples that'll go with this. So you're seeing um, a GIF of like some of the examples already, but as time proceeds, there'll be more examples for people to see how this works because math, 2D math is a little bit impenetrable for folks and I know that they want to use it, but, and they, I know that they have problems they want to solve, but they don't know how to get from this is what I want to do to this is how I do it. And here's the language and the code that bridges the gap. Uh, what else? Uh, segment circle intersects is another kind of thing that you see a lot in games. Although off the top of most people's heads, they go, well, I don't remember ever having to do that. But when I introduce the examples, people will see the reasoning behind you'd want to, why you'd want to do this and how you'd be able to shortcut some um, calculations and things like that. Yeah, that's, I, would, I would imagine that this is a little bit like uh, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of times this is sort of a side topic, but I see questions in the forums where somebody is really, they're like focused. They're like, I want to do this thing that I saw in a game, but they don't have the vocabulary or they don't have the background to ask the question. So they don't really even know what it is they want to do. They just know the end visual result they want. And so... Oftentimes, they'll ask a question that involves 2D math, but they don't know the right, they don't have the vocabulary to ask the question. So what I want to do is release this uh, plugin and then get out some examples saying, if this is the kind of thing you wanted to do, these are the steps you would take. Yeah, that makes, that makes complete sense because there's, there's going to be a, a, you know, the store, the marketplace is going to do a certain amount of advertising for you, right? Uh, initially, the, 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 there would be a, uh, population of plugins and and people will kind of be able to flip through and see all the different plugins that are available but then as more and more plugins become added it's going to become more noisier and noisier and things are right. going to get lost right so so uh, so we can push out things on the newsletter and we can talk about things on social media and we can do things on, on Corona geek and and people can look through the, through the marketplace and search uh, but at the end of the day yeah there, there's going to be a, a marketing component do this from the plugin de developer standpoint. So it's, it would be good for you like, to, for the people to follow the example that you're talking about of, of, of giving people an explanation of how this plugin could solve their problem. I just wanted to say too is uh, sorry if you heard me typing there is that this plugin is a fundamental component of some of my other work that may not necessarily be native. Um, another plugin slash uh, asset pack that I've been working, that I have actually sitting in the wings is um, what is called, what I call an action pack, which is sort of like a set of standard operations for action games, like seeking and aiming and uh, acceleration and intercepting a point and stuff like that. Sort of higher level math operations that use fundamental 2D math. And so those have always worked, but they've been a bit laggy because uh, previously I did everything in Lua, but with this plugin, you'll be able to see a significant speed up in those operations. So, um, okay, let me talk to Sudoku real quick. Yes, because Sudoku doesn't sound like it would, needed to be, it would need to be sped up or native. Actually, Sudoku, okay, I'll talk to that. So Sudoku is, <laughs> if you're not familiar, it's a, it's a grid game. <laughs> It's okay. You gave me an intro. You know, we don't have to agree on that. That's cool. So it's a, it's a, it's a I, Oh, I'm not disagreeing because I don't, I don't actually know anything about it. Okay. So Doku, is, it's like one of those things that I see requests for a lot and there's a lot of solutions out there. But uh, typically what you'd see people do when they want to make a Sudoku game is they would generate a whole bunch of puzzles in advance. And this, I'm in this category too. I've got a couple of Sudoku games out there. And what you do is you generate your puzzles in advance, you save that in a file or a database or whatever, and then you package it with your game, and then your game comes out, it's got 10,000 puzzles, that's it, you're done. No more puzzles, you can't have any more, because 10,000 is all you could fit in the, the thing. But nobody wants to do that. We'd all like to release a lightweight game that has a very small download, but has an infinite replayability. In other words, just generate more puzzles as you need them. So uh, the, the drawback is, is most people try to do this in again in Lua, and Lua is a great language, but the generation of a Sudoku puzzle, unless we're talking the small ones, is a computationally expensive operation, and there's a number of different ways to do it. But uh, and the reason is, is because basically what you're doing is you're forward solving this puzzle. You're saying, here, I'm just going to randomly place a, 
a number. And then I make sure that the next number that I place is a legal placement and it goes on and on. And that problem gets more and more complicated as you go forward. And then you have to backtrack and undo your decision and put another number in. And anyways, hmm. computationally expensive, i.e. takes a long time. So in Lua, trying to do that, you would get lags and hangs. So what I did was is uh, I produced a, uh, a generator in C that is fairly brute force and yet still pretty fast. And it's, it can be used to generate your standard two by two, three by three, three by three is the one that most people see when they look for Sudoku because it's a, it's a produces this three by three or nine grids of um, nine cells. Um, or the massive super uber four by four. Uh, in addition, it can generate uh, overlapping puzzles. So an overlapping puzzle, you see this a lot when people get, they're, they're too smart for their own britches and they've been able to like, you know, they're like, I'm the king of Sudoku, now I need a real challenge. <laughs> so you see these books where they've taken two, uh, two Sudoku puzzles or more, two or more Sudoku puzzles, and they overlap boxes. So the boxes are the groups of, of cells that are related to each other. So in this, in this box, I don't know if you can see, let me zoom way in. In this box, which has no numbers, it can have the numbers one through nine somewhere in this box. Now these two puzzles share this box. So for this upper puzzle, these numbers have to work. And for the lower puzzle, the numbers have to work. So in a nutshell, basically what this uh, puzzle, uh, I've said in a nutshell too many times. In summary, <laughs> uh, the generator allows you to uh, inject a predefined list of, of cell numbers. So you can create you can generate one puzzle and then you can extract the elements that you want for overlap and then inject those into the next generated puzzle. And then it's up to you to produce the actual game mechanic to put those two together. But that way you can get data sets that work together. So that's, that's basically it. It's just a very rudimentary, straightforward generator with a few options that let you produce an infinite number of Sudoku puzzles in the range two, three, and four by four. Nice. Nice. I didn't realize there was such a background, such a computationally intense background to s Sudoku. It's a, it's a traditional uh, problem for like computer scientists and whatever where they, you know, O-N, o, o -N squared type. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember which of those it is, but um, for or learning how to do a traversals and backtracking and stuff like that as far as generation go. Nice. Cool. And then what was the speed up that you saw on this going from Lua to, you know, I never even did it in Lua. I tried it one time, a long time ago. And it was just like, Oh man, I was just doing a traditional three by three and it was seconds. Whereas this can generate like a hundred puzzles in, in a, in a frame, something like that. I don't know. It's quite a number. I have, I'm still gotta, I gotta benchmark this a little bit on devices. I'm still working through the device builds. So, but it's far and away better. So, and when, when do you estimate that this will be available? I'm going to try to get it submitted today and then whenever it works its way through the process, hopefully I haven't messed up the, my struggle is, um, where, whereas I heard somebody else here say, I'm not much of a Windows guy. I'm not much of a Mac guy. <laughs> so, so I need to do the Mac. I, I need the enterprise need to put together the enterprise frame to properly build these. So I've, I've been doing all my testing with uh, Win32 builds, uh, making DLLs and then dropping the DLLs in um, the plugins folder locally and then testing it that way. But now I have to make sure that the Android and iOS and all the other builds work properly. It's just a question of getting the, the make files to work and set up correctly for, uh, for the staff to do the builds. Okay. Awesome. Looking forward to it. I think it's, I think this is great. And, and I, so you take this and then be able to, uh, I'm assuming then on top of that, you could add all kind of particle effects and do all kind of. Yeah, this is, um, I should stress that the Sudoku generator is just a generator. It's not the game. Uh, however, I, darn it. I stopped sharing, but, uh, I'll share it again. Put your, put your haptic engine. I'm stuff trying on to it. do this, uh, marketing smart sort of approach. So, yeah. In the FAQ, one of the questions is, is uh, does this plugin contain game logic? 
let me just make this bigger. No, it's just a generator. However, the Roaming Gamer does have a game template that uses this, which you can get, and then I'll have a link for it here. Because <laughs> I already have, a, I long time ago wrote a Sudoku game template, but that was with pre-generated content. I'm converting that over to use uh, you know, on the fly generation. It's already converted to actually, I just need to upload that to my store. Yeah. No, I think this is. I think this is smart, especially what you were talking about earlier with the other plugin, the Math 2D plugin, doing examples and videos, and and being able to reference that and point people in the right direction, and kind of, as you said, be be a translator, hear their question, and be like, oh yeah, what you're talking about is this. Boop, and send them. I'm to trying for a lot of synergy. Yeah, you know, my stuff's all related anyway, so I might as well make it interlinked. Right, right, exactly. And then when somebody says, "Oh, great, a, a, a Sudoku uh, generator," I mean, generator. That's great. Oh, uh, oh, a template. Oh, that's even better. Right. I mean, just yeah, you know, leave, boom, leave boom, right boom, boom, the right now. Right, right, right. Exactly. Uh, gap analysis. Just trying to figure out what is it. That's that you exactly need? what I'm doing. Gap oh, analysis. I got one Maybe of those. Right here. The list and go. Where's the gap? Maybe I can write a plugin for that. <laughs> right. Exactly. And I know you guys are too. Don't yeah. See, this is one of those other things where I think it would be cool. There's this potential to for people to write a giveaway, like Ed, you could give away the template for free, but it only works with your plugin, right? Um, so people can download the template for free, they can try it. And if they really like it, they say, well, this is pretty cool, this works great. But they can't build for the, you know, for the store until they purchase it, but they can test it out. And, and then you're kind of- um, I see you're trying to get me to give away my content again. No, but- all the secret sauces. I, I know what you're saying. I know all the secret sauce is in the plugin, right? That's you're the all, thing. You're that is, so that's pretty much the sauce. Although, the, although I have to honestly, the template's not too shabby either. Yeah, I mean, as long as you're not giving away too much with the template, you could do it in such a way that you're, you, you know, you're creating the template that's kind of, you know. work with that you could split the special sauce off to the side into a pub plugin and kind of work it that way versus having to because you could never do that normally like just give them a template and say well try it before you buy it because you just give them everything so that's that's a no-go but if if you could actually make it dependent on them having to eventually buy the the plugin and they can still doubt you know test it and play with it then uh that may have, you know, more sales ability because people can actually get yeah, it. I, I considered exactly that. It's just, um, you're right, you're right. It's just that I'm, the, the line I'm trying to draw right now is the template that I wrote originally still has significant content in it. I mean, relatively significant. So I may, like, make a reduced version of that for free that would be filling exactly the, the uh, gap that you're talking about. So, no, absolutely, Mike, you're absolutely right. What hey, I, I forgot to say is I didn't show the demo of some of the things that the 2D math library does. So this is, you could think, can you see this? Yeah. Okay, you could think of this as kind of being like a security camera. And the security camera's rotating, and this guy, this little dot representing like an enemy or maybe your player is moving around. And every time it turns green, that means the security camera can see the bad guy or the good guy or whatever, whatever the scenario is. So it's just a, a concept demonstration. And the little blue line coming out there is your center of the uh, field of view. So this is, a, this is a situation where the camera has a 90 degree field of view, 45 degrees on each side. So, so and of course you're, you're making them all move just for illustration purposes. Yeah, I'm making it move to test the, I'm making, yeah. it moves to test the uh, algorithm. But actually this sample code will be available and people will be able to just tweak it to do different kind of like just rotate the dot, just rotate the, the block, or don't rotate either, but rotate the field of view. Mm. Uh, one thing that I, I added to this was is consider if you would, you've created a game where you've created a sprite where the sprite looks like it's rotating. It's just animating. But the block itself is always facing in the same direction. So what you would need to do then is you'd need to say, okay, forget about the rotation of the block. Calculate the field of view on this number that I'm going to give you, which is my estimated pointing of the sprite. And so every time the sprite frame would update, it would update the field of view check and say, okay, the this, this sprite is now facing to the left, facing to the right, whatever. Anyways, 
I'm talking and this is perhaps not so clear, but I had hoped to have a demo, but you know what? You can only do so much coding between yesterday and today. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. No, that, I think that gives us a nice, a nice view. Well, I, I'm, I'm excited by this. Um, uh, speaking of gap analysis, I mean, the, this idea of, of, of giving people, you know, what it is they're looking for. Uh, Danny, you, you have a PayPal plugin. And I think in, I liked in your description of your the plugin, you said, you know, there's there's several ways to do in-app purchase, uh, you know, purchase of digital goods, but physical goods, there's there's just not any kind of uh, there's not many options, or if, if any. So tell, exactly. us about, so tell us about the paper um, plugin. I just see there was a feature request for this, and this was a plugin I had previously from the the Gremlin Interactive experiment that you may remember from before. Um, so I decided to get it all updated for the for the new PayPal SDKs and get it on the Corolla plugin store. Um, the usage is still exactly the same. Um, the only difference is from if you already used the plugin before a year ago or so, um, two variables uh, change names, just lower, lower casing. Um, I'll just see if I can get this up. You know, we, we, we mentioned earlier that uh, Apple doesn't like to be cut out of the process. And, um, I assume that since, in this case, you're selling physical goods that they, they don't have a mechanism for, they don't, they don't ding you or care about this type of stuff, right? So we can use the plug-in without getting slapped around by Apple, is that what we're saying? Exactly, yeah. They allow you to um, use other services aside from them for payments as long as it's not for digital goods. Um, well, six. Let's try to pick a skin that'll make it so you can see it. Try them. Just you have, I, I haven't talked to Jason about this. Do you guys know if he's going to try to convert his Stripe plugin plug to uh, for sale in the stores? You might know. I think Jason's waiting to do his his plugins uh, for when they support pure Lua plugins and stuff. I don't know. It, although I thought his Stripe plugin was actually a negative. You're right. Huh, I don't. Yeah, I don't remember. But having you yeah. know having having multiple like Stripe and PayPal and all that kind of stuff like that just give give people an option to be able to purchase in the way that they want. So right. Although yeah. they're both cool. That's great. Go ahead, Danny. So can you see the screen? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so this plugin offers two types of payments. Um, single payments, which are just one-off purchases, and also um, agreements where you can... How can I explain this? So using this example here in the, the bus. So say, for instance, you're agreeing that the bus company may charge you um, every time you go for go for a ride, um, so you just get on the coach, click. Yeah, not, not necessarily a reoccurring subscription, but, a, but as you say, an agreement uh, that, that they, you've already connected your, your information together and you, they can charge you. Exactly, like to say the same system is implied by Dropbox where they're, you've, you're consenting to allow them to charge you again in the future. Um, so I'll just show you this now. Hopefully it works. Uh, there was an issue when I was developing this. Um, I finished on Saturday, and then about an hour after I finished, it stopped working. Oh, looks like it stopped working again. And um, PayPal broke the sandbox. And they said they fixed it, and it was working earlier today. Oh, this is all connecting to the sandbox? Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's mm -hmm. not, not a very stable environment. Anything that says, you know, sand in it. <laughs> I can show you the anyway. Um, so you can also, you can pay uh, one of two ways. One is via your PayPal account, and the other is via the card feature. Um, now, obviously, the, uh, the simulator doesn't support um, your camera for some reason, so you have to enter the details manually. But on your phone, if your phone has um, a camera, it'll allow you to, it'll show a little overlay, and you just hold your card in front of your phone, and it scans the card, and it, that results in these card numbers and uh, the expiry date being pre-filled for you. 
I'm obviously yet to enter the CVP yourself. And so it's a nice little feature. Um, the agreements. So basically the window types are basically the same. Um, single payment shows you the amount. Um, the subscription type payment just shows you the login window. So you, you'd put your own payment flow before this, like you're consenting that we can charge you as described in the uh, agreement. And once they log in, that will give you the information. Oh, it's working now. Okay, here it is. So if you ask you, you can pre-approve future payments, maybe a PayPal account, blah, blah, blah. And these links here, um, your privacy policy and user agreement, you can specify these yourself. Um, if you don't, they fall back to the default PayPal privacy policy and user agreements. So you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, there we go. So now we've agreed to, to get the bus ticket and see if this one works now. Oh, okay. And yeah, so they, they had a bug anyway that I opened with them um, on Saturday about the sandbox. They said it's fixed, but it looks like it kind of is. So I had to revisit that. But um, that's pretty much it. Very simple. Um, the documentation, I'll just change screens. Can you, what, is there any particular type of uh, PayPal account that you have to have in order to do this? Can it be like a personal account or a business account or? Okay, so you can, if you want to test uh, live payments, you can use your own proper PayPal account. Um, if you want to test the sandbox environment, you have to, we have to sign up anyway um, with them to get your API credentials. Um, once you do, they have a section where you can add in um, sandbox test accounts and they give you all the relevant IDs. The, I'll see if we can bring that up. It's actually improved a lot since the first time I released this. Um, it used to be very rough. It took me longer to document how to get your um, credentials than it did to make the plugin. So let's see. I'll just share the whole screen. Hey, I just wanted to comment on that. Does everybody agree that doing documentation is more work than doing the plugins. Oh yeah. It took me longer to do the uh, the sections on my website than it did make to update the plugin. Um, I can say the commentation is morally more difficult. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so, taking me like twice as long to do the docs as it did to write the actual code. <laughs> I just started copy and pasting my old ones and like, you know, kind of reformatting it. So I kind of saved some time there. So this answers a question to a degree, Charles. Um, this is the PayPal dashboard that you see when you log in. Um, you'll see that I've created a test app down at the bottom. Um, this guy explains how to work through the process. Um, you get his set your credentials there, your client ID, things like that. Um, and below that section, I didn't do bother documenting that because it's very straightforward. But in the box below that, you see a listing of your sandbox test accounts and you can add as many as you want there. And there's some default ones set up based on your email address that you signed up with, with PayPal. So for instance, mine would be hello plus PayPal at infusedreams.com. So it creates a few aliases for you out the box, which is nice. And uh, that's pretty much it. It's very simple to use. There's free functions um, in it, which is only used to initialize the plugin and set the event listener. Um, <laughs> config, which is used to configure your um, client, your um, credentials, your environment, for instance, sandbox or production. Um, if you want to accept credit cards or not, and just some of the various things like your privacy policy URL, et cetera. And then show just um, takes two parameters. First one is the type of PayPal window you wish to show, um, which is either payment for single payments or future payment for when the user consents to agree to be charged in the future. And again, you can just configure some properties here. Description is the one shown in the uh, you for your item, um, and you can change credit cards there if you want to accept credit cards per item, for instance. 
and that's pretty much it. So uh, the first thing I think of when, when uh, future payments, like you're saying, the the ride sharing thing, um, but there's also you know maybe maybe like um, you know membership dues or, or something like that, right? Something that would be recurring, uh, not necessarily a digital good, but maybe like a again like a membership, like an access to something. I, guess, I don't know if that falls into the terms member of a digital good, but. I guess maybe it does because it's sort of a subscription, you know, and, and Apple does subscriptions. So, yeah. I, what's that? Uh, uh, Apple does not want to use, like, PayPal as a subscription method. Right. So, that's what, I, that's what I'm saying. I, I, at first, my first thought is, hey, I can see how this would be used for some, some, kind of, some sort of, almost like Patreon, right? Some sort of membership, some sort of, you know, member-based. Um, sub- I think it. Maybe enough for that. They do allow you to use it for donations, as far as I'm aware. And I'll mm-hmm. the You could use donations. So I know Patreon's kind of a, a thin line, but it's possible, I suppose. And okay. I, could, I, su- I suppose my only advice to people on that front would be to make sure you do your research before you bother going through the process of implementing it and finding out that Apple don't allow it. So <laughs> always better to be safe. Yeah. So that yeah, that would, thank you very much because that was my my thought as well. Is, is uh, you know this seems like a very powerful plugin. Uh, just be careful. Uh, you know, do your homework before before going down that path. Uh, but for physical goods, sounds like a great thing. Well, very cool. And this is gonna this is already available in the the marketplace, right? I mean, we saw that earlier. Uh, yeah, this is available and it's twenty five percent off for the first seven days. So celebrate the store opening. Okay, so so everybody should go check that out. So they should go check out the Math Two D plugin. They should go check out uh, the Vibration plugin. They should go check out the Pebble uh, plugin. Still, uh, development. still in development, but it, you know, as soon as it's in the store, I, you, I know you have a ton of other plugins, so they can definitely go look for uh, anything that you've created uh, as well as well. So I think the last thing that we've got it's not necessarily plugin related, but it is, it is particularly exciting, and that is uh, a, a demo project that Pony Wolf is working on, Michael Wilson, who's joining us on the call. So, Michael, you want to give us kind of a demo of what you what you got going on? Sure. Um, yeah, so we've been kind of talking about uh, – let me get rid of this the sound on this for myself here. Um, Seem to be completely not uh, ready to show this, which is kind of funny. <laughs> Snap cooperating with you. Yeah, it's just one of those things where I have a theme song playing, and it's actually louder than everything else in my headphones. Um, so, <laughs> so it's hard to, to, hard to concentrate. That out first. Okay, good deal. Let's share here. Um, second best dot. All right. Um, yeah, so we're taking kind of another approach to um, uh, the asset store. Um, and without getting too into it, um, I think what we're thinking about is, is selling um, assets that are kind of pre-contained screens um, uh, within the asset store or uh, pre-contained scenes within the asset store. Um, so taking everything you need to do to make a game and, um, you know, having that as something that you can pull down the graphics, the sound, the code, everything associated with that particular, uh, kind of gameplay item. Um, pretty similar, I think, to what Unity would call like a prefab. And so there's obviously prefabs in Unity that are, you know, um, you know, like a car item that has a function attached to it where you can explode that car, um. And then other prefabs understand, um, you know, those same functions. What we're looking at here is kind of a a first demo that uh, we're putting out for for free, um, probably with a series of demos, actually, um, that covers some kind of basic, um, uh, really, game designs. And we're trying to do it in a way... Um, where the individual pieces are scenes. So I think I've not, not done a great job of, uh, of setting that up. But uh, uh, so what we're looking at here is basically two kind of individual plugins, two functions. Uh, one, which is uh, up here, kind of an RPG um, hallway, right, with an enemy and, um, um, who can be attacked. 
So if I match these three things, I attack that enemy. And then down here, you have a three match um, uh, system, uh, which basically um, you know, takes a series of graphics and a directory and uh, builds up everything you need to do to build a three match game. Um, and without going too in depth into it, um, you know, we're talking um, super, super simple, um, you know, ability to make a three match game. If we can see this here, um, you know, there's just a variable, make a new three match game. How many rows, how many columns do you want? Um, center that board on the screen and then all of the individual matching um, what happens within that game gets delivered uh, via an event listener here, which is matched. Uh, so basically kind of real quick, you can spin up a three match game. Um, if I want uh, seven rows of three match rather than five, I can just switch up that one variable. And now I have a seven row three match game. Um, you know, the concept here is, is that uh, I think with the asset store and people kind of buying pre-done assets, uh, sure, people are going to want some functionality pieces. Uh, so they're going to want Bluetooth plugins and they're going to want, um, you know, additional native kind of features. But I think, um, you know, if the other asset stores, the other game development engines kind of give us any hints, um, users are going to be able to buy a platformer. They're going to be able to buy a three match game. They're going to buy some of these kind of pre-done assets um, that they can go in and tweak and put together in interesting ways. So in this particular demo, which we're hoping to release uh, sometime next week, um, you'll have everything to build kind of a Bard's Tale like uh, RPG game um, or a three match game. So you can pull, pull, pull these pieces apart and put them back together in any way you see fit. I love that when you were, you were showing me this previously, like the, the, the health bar was a module and the hearts bar was a module and the score counting was a module. And, you know, you could kind of each one of those things kind of stand or standalone pieces. Um, you yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, you know, if you look at, um, you know, even the enemy here, uh, they try to find, um, you know, so if you wanted to um, create the alien that we see here, um, let's see if we can go and find them here. I got to put some keys together. Um, creating this alien um, is just making an alien monster dot new. And this alien is a display group that comes back with the animation associated with it. Um, the ability to adjust its X and Y insert it inside of a scene group. Um, and then providing a table here with parameters, um, you could you know, kind of break the default. Uh, what color do you want this alien to be? What graphic do you want it to be associated with? How much, uh, how much damage it can take? Um, and then the alien also has kind of keys associated with it, right? So alien.alive means the alien's alive. Um, uh, whereas the, uh, um, if I want to hurt the alien, I call alien colon hurt. Um, so it's just very kind of natural, natural language association with this. And our hope is, is to kind of expand these modules out. So, you know, kind of our, our monster module here, um, is going to be, you know, part of a larger enemy class. It's going to let you build an enemy, um, that could, you know, in its most basic uh, sense could sit here in the middle of the screen. Um, but in its most complicated sense could be a platformer uh, monster that knows how to hunt, um, you know, another character down, knows how to jump over objects, knows how to turn around, face the right direction. Um, kind of taking some of those concepts that Ed was talking about and, and incredibly hiding those from the user, right? Um, so you just create an enemy class, you just put them into a physics scene and it goes off and it does, um, it does its stuff. So... Um, obviously we got way more to talk about and how this works and how it's kind of set up than what we have time for today. But, um, um, you know, our plan is, is to do, you know, kind of nice bite sized chunks on each one of the modules, um, inside the system. Um, and, uh, yeah, expand on it until we get to the point where we have some, um, you know, pretty, um, uh, pretty slick, uh, you know, kind of expanded Corona demos is probably a way to talk about it. 
uh, where we're covering um, how to build a platform or how to build an RPG, how to build a three match game, how to build a shooter, how to build all of that stuff. Um, and by keeping it kind of modular, um, it really allows a budding game designer to kind of say, oh, I want to take the RPG module and I want to take the three match module and I want to take this and I want to take that and kind of put it together to make a new, new concept. So, well, I, I tell you what, one of the other things I really liked was this idea that you were saying, okay, hey, let's, you know, now that we have these things, let's take the asset pack and let's put it on an, on, on an indie, uh, you know, site that, that features asset packs and stuff and let's take the let's take the sounds and let's do that and let's put the game up on itch io and and let's you know let's let's do these things that sort of is the marketing aspects of things right the the, the lead generation aspects of things and and of course in this case they would lead back to corona uh, where people could then you know get the get the game from the marketplace and things like that but for everybody else who is here on the call as a a plugin developer i'm thinking you know just like mike uh was kind of alluding to before about having the the, the free template that been required the the uh, sudoku uh generator uh you know it wouldn't be a bad idea to put out sort of a modified version of whatever it is that you're selling and then lead, lead back to the full version that you could then purchase in the marketplace because there's going to be that infrastructure for being able to take payments and, and discovery and, and all of those other things in the marketplace, which is where you want that to, uh, transaction to happen. But then of course you, you want to kind of go out uh, uh, and tell people about it so that, and then lead them back to the point where they can make the purchase. Yeah. So you may have somebody that stumbles upon this image on Graphic River or Open Game Art and sees a CC0 licensed, uh, you know, basically, um, you know, art package um, that has everything from, you know, uh, scenes to, you know, damage states to all this. And I mean, this is a small uh, portion of what we're actually going to be giving away as part of this. Um, and, uh, then the next logical step is, is like, oh, this art looks cool. I wonder what it looks like in a game. Well, Hey, you just pop on over to, you know, itch.io or, uh, the app store and, you know, you can sit here and kind of play those graphics in the game. And then we're hoping the next logical step after that is, is wow, what they write that in. That seems really cool that, uh, you can have this on PC and Mac and iOS and Android and all those pieces, um, and that they eventually find their way back to Corona. Um, and then are able to find, uh, you know, lots of assets like this free and paid on the Corona uh, marketplace. So, nice. yeah, yeah. So we're, you know, again, that documentation, everybody said it, um, you know, getting uh, uh, the stuff to a point where, um, you know, it's really comfortable and really easy to kind of figure out how these different modules work and explaining how it works. Um, and again, I think Charles has got a great idea around, um, you know, kind of doing this visually kind of like what we do here and kind of stripping down some of these scenes, um, and focusing on, okay, let's do, you know, 15 minutes on how to build this top module out and what are the various uh, things here and 15 minutes on what's a three match look like, and maybe five minutes on how do I do a health bar, um, yeah you know, that uh, automatically regenerates and follows an object around and, you know, how do I do a score module and, you know, all of these little pieces. Nice. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend everybody here to become comfortable with video. I mean, I think we, we all uh, are to some degree because we get on these hangouts and, and then talk yeah, together yeah. and that sort of thing. And I know, I know, Ed, I know you put out a lot of, a lot of uh, um, videos on your channel, on your Roman Gamer channel. Yeah, little uh, micro videos. Little micro videos. I mean, there's some of them are silent films because there's not any audio to it and stuff like that. But but it's but it's good to. That's right. I think it's good to to. Uh, it, it's great to have the documentation. The documentation can be searched. The documentation is organized and takes you through a logical sequence of you know it's it's something that somebody can slice and dice and use as they see fit for their particular instance. But it never. I mean, never hurts to have that video where you're just like, oh, oh, now I see what it does. <laughs> right? And it just sort of sums it all up in a series of images. Uh, so, uh, I think as we all move to being these paid uh, plug-in, paid asset, paid whatever content creators trying to, to, to interest people in buying our, our wares, you know, video is going to play, play a big piece. I got to say, I'm so ex I'm so happy. Not excited. Yeah, I'm so, I'm happy. so excited. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna start singing. I'm so happy that the plugins. I'm sorry. The marketplace is finally 
opened for, you know, doing, I mean, clearly we're still in the plugins phase, but man, Mike's stuff is going to come out. I'm going to be doing stuff. I mean, this is going to be awesome. Yeah. I'm, I've yeah. been looking for this for like forever. So this yeah. is going to be a big deal for the Corona community. So now, I, I, I really need this. Let's, let's go ahead, Sergey. You finally doing native ads. So that was a big step up. Yeah. Oh, I had to. I had to brush off my uh, my uh, native programming skills. It was a little bit painful there for a while. By the way, uh, how does it compare to make native for Windows, for Mac, for uh, Objective C, for Android, for you? How, how, um, ask the question again. How does what compare? Yeah, how does it compare to you know, how it feels like for you? Um, how, do you, yeah, how do you like native versus uh, the versus Lua? I guess. Well, well no, it's it has to be easier in Lua, but uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Okay, I'll say that native coding is still very painful for me because um, there's a lot of questions you got to deal with a Lua stack when you're pulling things off and on. Put you know put pull them off the stack, push them onto the stack. Uh, you want to access uh, functions and methods on objects. You want to return references to objects. That's all sort of like little black magic-y to me still. Sad to say, I shouldn't say that out loud. Oh, too late. Anyways, um, yeah, native Lua is basically assembly programming, which is somebody in the chat said here. I won't say who. <laughs> it's, it's good once you get your head around it, but man, just native Lua coding, so much faster as far as like implementing stuff. It's like my brain just goes there. Um, as far as like, is it painful to do the, the, the multiple different environments, like having to set up the uh, Android build and the iOS build and the Windows build and all that? Yeah, that's a little painful. But again, it's just a question of like learning the scaffolding the first time and then it's, it's, a, one, it's a one stop deal, right? You know, you code it once, you get it working in one platform and then you just update your make files and make sure you get all the dependencies in place and boom. So I don't feel too bad about it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. I would be, okay, so here's, as you're saying that, Ed, I'm, I'm actually thinking it would be great to have, a, a, I'd like to see the first project where multiple people work on different pieces of it and then it gets sold in the marketplace as a, as a plugin. So imagine a private repo where, you know, Ed and Steven and Sergey and, and Scott and, and um, Danny all work on different aspects of, a, of that plugin. And then, and, then, and then that finished product then goes into the, the marketplace. And then behind the scenes, you guys, you know, figure out how the, the, the split. So. Well, we uh, have collaborated with Scott. He worked on testing and we share the free, equally free to him and free to me. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, there's definitely collaboration that's going on here. Uh, so that's already sort of happened in some way. But I'm just, I'm just talking about, you know, you, you say you're not, a, you're not a Mac guy and you say you're not a Windows guy and you say, you know what I'm saying? Like, just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah right. just, Each of us has our strengths, I think. And that'd be, that'd be cool yeah. to collaborate a little bit and kind of lift that pain. Yeah, I don't know. Just, just, I'm just spitballing here. Stephen, you, you, do you, what, are you, um, what are you putting out on the marketplace? I should have... I know it's loud in the background. What do you? Lua Proc is posted, and I don't know when it's going to go live, but it's, it's it should be there soon. That's the one I showed it before with the threads. Mm -hmm. So there's that, and then I have in the works, not ready yet, but in the works, uh, the image loading thing that I showed a couple of weeks ago, okay. two or four weeks ago, where it has various image loaders, various image savers. You can. You can save to JPEG, ping, GIF, uh, loading GIF too. So it's a handy feature. And then it'll have some other image operations on the side, like uh, box filters. I think some people complain about the, um, what do you call it, the Gaussian blur. And then have made their own assets in Photoshop. This would let you do it in, in code. Uh, and then I've got a, a, a glyph renderer, so for rendering text. I, I said glyph instead of text because it could be you know, little icons and wingdings. And, <laughs> but, uh, but that I'm still, I'm still plugging away at docs and, and everything for. 
Okay. And you're thinking about making these, these are going to be paid plugins or are these going to be free? Yeah. Plugins? Those, those two I plan to have paid. And then I have the, um, the bitmap thing I showed before for loading will be free. So just that's, that's basically just to receive data. So it's for everything. Okay. Is that your stomach talking there, Steve? That is a boss. That's right, no. <laughs> Sounds like they need to get their brakes checked. I, uh, yeah, I wish I was in a deeper residential area, but <laughs> I'm right on the street. <laughs> that's cool. Well, you're not literally on the street, because that would be a very interesting but, video. Uh, right. You're right. You're right. right. Oh, hey, right, uh, Steve? Oh, oh. I'm sorry, right. but I, I might have missed something there. There was a request in the forums recent uh, last week uh, for a noise generator. Are I you gonna take that one on? I haven't. I, I'm pretty uh, full up on the stuff right now, so I haven't. Yeah, I'm pretty full too. Although I had been considering that one, especially since it uh, dovetails nicely with the demo that um, Corona put out for generating textures. You ever see the episode of Friends where uh, um, I think the there's somebody's moving moving apartments or something like that, and they ask Phoebe if she would like to you know she if she can help that weekend and say and Phoebe says oh you know what I'd really like to but I don't want to <laughs> that's what I think of when he said I'm, I'm kind of full up <laughs> I'd really like to but I don't want to <laughs> I'd like to do a lot of things if I just had like ten of me <laughs> right yeah. Um. The thing, that, the thing that I'm working on, aside from this, uh, at some point I want to go back to video because uh, I think I'm going to have to abandon VLC just because of the license. Mm. It's LGPL, and right now the store doesn't like that, so I'll probably go to Fiora. But still, still, still doing the same thing where you can load a texture with the video. And then I'm, I'm doing a, uh, a number array, which is basically for for doing large operations on numbers all at once. Because I, I have a lot of things where I need to do just the same thing over and over and over again. And doing it through Lua kind of burns, burns all of that cycle. So just blasting number operations. <laughs> that, that involves a lot of using all these acceleration libraries and that's slow going. <laughs> I've said this before, but uh, you're, you're too darn smart. I tell you what, you know, Steve, your your ideas. I'm like, I think I understand what he's saying, kind of. Yeah, my mind blown for sure. I mean, at, you guys, I don't know if Steve shares his uh, Git. His not Git. You use a different repository, but his repository. Is, yeah, yeah. With it's like I've looked at some of your projects. I'm like. Dude, I totally don't get this. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Oh, which is, which is good because, because, because you know, I, I, that, those are the types of things that I certainly, you know, like, like haptic uh, feedback, like uh, PayPal, like, you know, I, I want to play for those things. I don't want to, I don't want to code those things. I just want to pay for those things and move on. Well, a huge amount of the work is just, is finding other people's libraries and then using those. If I had to do this from scratch, it would take years. So, <laughs> but, uh, so, the work is more in bringing other people's stuff into projects I'm working on at the moment. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, that's a, that's a, an hour and a half uh, of, of plug-in and asset goodness. So I think we'll leave it there for this week. Uh, everyone listening should go out to the marketplace. Uh, you can get there from go, by going to coronalabs.com and just clicking on marketplace up there in the, in the menu. And you can check out all the plugins that are there. It's a growing list of uh, plugins. And as this monetization, this paid plugin, um, pay plug-in opportunity comes uh, online for the community. I'm sure that will uh, uh, balloon. It will definitely expand. So I'm, I'm excited to see all this stuff growing and and, um, and becoming a reality. Because as we've said, I don't know if we've, we've, we've probably said it a couple of times. We've probably said it a couple of times more. It's been a long time coming, and uh, it's just really exciting to see it coming, you know, all together and being a reality. So. All right. Thanks for being here. We will see you next time. Until then, happy coding and uh, take it easy. Cheers.